So the, the question is this, in today's relationship, uh, in the culture wars of the American evangelical movement, uh, and by this, I think I'm going to go back to sort of its origins in the late 60s, uh, Paul Weyrich and where all that came from, uh, and the Russian Orthodox Church. And I'm specifically saying the Russian Orthodox Church because of Kirill and, and, and Putin. How would you uh, evaluate the pros and cons of that situation? And remember, I gave you three hours, no more. Um, so I'm fascinated by this relationship for like a host of reasons. Um, one is I grew up in Colorado before Colorado was cool when like focus on the family was in charge, right? And um, I got called like a Mary worshiper on the playground. So it's super weird to me that then like Franklin Graham goes and becomes friends with the Russian church. Um, I think that, I think what attracted Orthodox people to the relationship, particularly in America, is immigrant assimilationism, right? Like you have arrived if like American evangelical Protestants accept you who are sort of American Christians par excellence. Um, and I think the evangelical movement has been very um, strategic in this, right? So the way they've built that conservative coalition that is by bringing in conservative Catholics, conservative Orthodox Christians, conservative Jews. These are Orthodox Christians, Catholics, Jews. These are all people who, when their you know, ancestors came here even 50 years ago, were on the sort of periphery of American culture. And they get brought in by being part of this alliance that really does prioritize um, the political demands of white Southern evangelical Christians um, who tend to be rural and people from immigrant communities tend to be urban. So there is this added voice in American political life and for the Russian church in Russia, um, it's a seat at the table of American power, right? It gets you, having relationships with American evangelicals gets you very close to the seat of American power. The um, downside, and as you can imagine, I think there's a downside. Um, well, I think a couple things. First, I think one of the really interesting things that's happened is that um, Christian identity, with, you know, identities within Christianity were once defined by theological positions right, um, by how people felt about things like Trinity and the perpetual virginity of Mary. And today they're defined by politics, which is why if you're someone like me and you make state certain statements, people online tell you to become an Episcopalian, which makes more sense than the next one, which is become a Unitarian, as though the teaching of Trinity was less important than, you know, quite frankly, stupid political stuff. And when you get into these alliances, and part that's how the even that's how the conservative religious tradition has been formed, is by encouraging people to subliminate theological differences in the name of political unity. And I think that's really dangerous, and it's super problematic because it tells people that the temporary secular concerns of this moment are more are more important than eternal theological truth. And it is an incredibly small way of looking at the world. It's an incredibly small way of looking at Christianity. So I don't know if I answered the question, but I certainly got to answer all my favorite soapboxes. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. Uh, any more, any questions from the floor? I'll bring you the microphone. Okay, one, one second. If you don't mind standing here, no then we put, we put you on camera. Talking about evangelicals and orthodox, do you know who Hank Henneman is? Yes. Well, he converted to Greek orthodoxy and a, a big brouhaha among evangelicals. And they discuss this. One of the things they talk about orthodox, they say, you know, they're a strange group. They believe in necromancy. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this profound ignorance. There's an arrogance and an ignorance directed towards the Orthodox Church. And so I think the relationship between evangelicals and Orthodox in many cases, it's like between Stalin and Hitler, 
before 1941. <laughs> Privately, they don't like each other, but in public, they'll hold hands. <laughs> you don't like one thing. I sorry, can't can't shut me up. Um, yeah, I mean this this is the this is the thing. It's like I'm um, also like. Um, Hank Hangerman, the Bible Answer Man, became Orthodox, and then like didn't change his show. He just like grew a beard, and that suggests to me that some of this is. And I'm not little bit for me to judge anyone, but I do think that some of this. I mean, none of this is theological, right? Like all of this is about political opportunism, and we should be, if nothing else, we should be calling that out because they still do think we're like Mary worshiping necromancers, but because it like gets us a seat on the Supreme Court, we're happy about it. True, true. <laughs> Thank you. Do I keep this? Thank you. That was yeah. that was a I'm great that was a great question. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, so we have three questions that came in online. Uh, the first two are open to all of you. The last one will be to Sister Vasa. Uh, so the first question is, uh, whoever wants to answer it, or all three of you, what can Orthodox Christians do to combat lust for power and culture wars? Sister? Uh, uh, <laughs> and cultural wars. Well, I think that as far as my talk goes, I suggested some of the strategies uh, at the end of my paper as to how we can battle any, what was the, what were the two things? Lust for power so and culture wars? Lust for power and culture wars. Um, those aren't two, those are actually, they overlap, don't they? <laughs> Uh, so it, it, the question is difficult to answer because it's not very logical. Uh, but uh, as we battle anything else, is we refocus on Christ, I think, and repentance is generally the, it's sort of a spiritual question and nobody wants a nun preaching to them right now on how to battle <laughs> sin. What's more dull than that on a Friday night, right? <laughs> um, but I, I think that it is important to identify what it is rather than a, a you know virtuous fight or something that identifies you as orthodox sometimes we mistake uh, all of that stuff for church life and we think that that means being orthodox and i think that the fact that politics has turned into a religion and religion has turned into politics as i like to say is just another it's a surrogate Constantly there is a battle actually to live for the church to be church throughout history really it's not original for our time but uh, we should be a little bit more sophisticated and not take the surrogates for being church. I mean if you happen to be someone that seems on the right side of our favorite issues today and they seem to change either with every generation or even more quickly than that. Uh, you know, the litmus test now for whether or not you're orthodox, as far as I can see in American orthodoxy, even though I don't live in the U.S. of A, um, for more than half of my life I've been living in, in Europe and also in, in some other places. Uh, but uh, the litmus test now seems to be whether, uh, seems to be how you look at the issue of gay marriage, as far as I can see. It used to be uh, abortion. Now, the, even though abortion's coming back into vogue because of certain realities in the U.S. and you know Roe v. Wade being um, maybe I don't know whether it'll be overturned. Um, Katie knows more about that, uh, but you know it's it's a surrogate for uh, the the struggle and real challenge and real interesting adventure that being a Christian actually is. It makes it, you know, it's it, it's a reductionist vision of what it means uh, to be a Christian in the first place. And being an Orthodox Christian is an interesting, uh, you know, challenge. And I think that this cheap, uh, who called it uh, cheap grace? Um, yeah, there's there's that idea of cheap grace of, uh, right, Bonhoeffer. Um, 
uh, <laughs> Father John mentioned that to me on our right here. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm saying we're accepting cheap surrogates for actually being church. And I think it's a time for us to reflect more deeply. That's why we have Father John Bear's talk tomorrow on the topic of what is church. Uh, because all of this stuff, it really shouldn't constantly be occupying us. I would, I would suggest throw my two bits into the one way to, to for Orthodox Christians to combat the lust for power is to stop lusting for power. <laughs> Anyway, that's just that's my cheap two-bit line. Thank you. Uh, uh, so the next uh, question, sorry. sorry. One, one second. Uh, since I promised that we would alternate, uh, I would like first to ask if uh, anyone uh, who's present in this room has uh, a question. We've always had differences of opinion in this country. We've always had fringe groups. The KKK, the John Birch Society, although the KKK grew its roles to over a million right after the Depression, so maybe they weren't a fringe group. <clears throat> but today we have a phenomena, and all of you touched on this, variations of the truth, how we accept distortions and alternate facts, I guess they called it. How do we continue in this country where a third, maybe more of the population would say the piano on our right isn't brown, it's red. That's no longer a fringe group. We're talking a third of the population in this country that will not accept basic fact. How do we continue? I, I think that uh, there is a call to be witnesses. You know, there is a call already in Isaiah, and then uh, our Lord Jesus Christ says to his disciples, you know, you will be my witnesses, which is martyres in the Greek. You will be my martyrs. There is an aspect to witness, which in the Slavonic is uh, to be uh, someone who sees together with, or se viditil, so viditil, right? Uh, it is someone who shares a vision and who has been privy to a vision that might get him in trouble by then telling about it, right? Uh, and then it's a complicated and contested etymology as to where the word martyr comes from, but it's said to be shared, that it shares an etymology with like the the, that with words that denote some kind of pain, even the German word sh Schmerz shares an etymology with martyr, Schmerz meaning pain, even memory, and um, uh, there are several other uh, verbs that come into play that actually mean a painful kind of memory that you carry, that you, we could say, uh, it might cause you pain to, to witness to an unpleasant truth. So if everybody believes that this, the earth is flat, it might get you in trouble to say that no, it's round. This has happened in history, right? And if today we have to pr profess uh, with some un you know discomfort in front of our elderly clergy in some cases, right, that killing is bad, trying to seize uh, a sovereign land, seize what is not belong to you, right? To support this and to say, well, war is war. When you point out the rapes and other atrocities, right? Things happen in war. It's like saying boys will be boys. Plus they were provoked, you know, but if a crime has occurred uh, and you say a rape has occurred, just uh, say here in our neighborhood, and you want to argue, say you're, let's even add to it that you're a priest and you start arguing, he was provoked, you know? The rapist was provoked because uh, these, let's say Ukrainians live in this area, right? Or Ukrainian women, they tend to dress too sexy, right? So they're provoked. And this is the arguments we hear today. And you actually fear a little bit for your, you know, sort of church political survival um, or your survival in general for witnessing, right? Uh, you, you can get people very angry by pointing out it's not an argument to say that Putin was provoked, right? It still doesn't justify all of the killing. And raising to the ground, people think, no, but NATO and no, all of this, you know, smoke and mirrors that goes up. But wait a minute, 
all the killing, you know? And why are Ukrainians dying? Why are children dying? And all of this stuff. But, you know, we do have a culture and a church tradition that really glorifies martyrs before all other categories of saints. And we like to uh, share these stories, to celebrate these saints. But then when it comes to down to us being in the position of putting our lives on the line, or even our even our church political standing. You know, like the parents of the man born blind that are like, they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. That's like us getting kicked out of our synagogue, right? To say the unpleasant thing. But then why do we glorify those who put down their lives, right? That overcame fear. We glorify their fearlessness and their testimony. And I think that this loss of the basic Christian ethos uh, of fearlessness when it comes to witnessing to truth. This is a major thing for us. We even have these saints that I think very perplexingly for us, maybe in a way that's terrifying for us, would bring their children to, to die for Christ. How about Saint Sophia, right? And her children, faith, hope, and charity. She's like, come along, you know, yay, my children are dying for Christ, right? And then she herself dies on their grave after she wheels their little dead bodies, martyred relics, right? To, uh, and buries them outside of Rome. And then she dies on their grave. We celebrate these saints every year, right? But is that just a story uh, for, I don't know, for, for whom, right? Uh, there is, I think, of course we don't, I'm not saying that we put ourselves in harm's way, that we seek out harm or harm for our children, right? But when we have a situation that I think doesn't happen all the time, but we have, uh, we have now reached a point in history and in our church history where there seems to be uh, this necessity that we didn't seek out, right? Where we seem to have to say, wait a minute, the earth is not flat, it's round. Right? Killing is bad. And I think that the willingness to stand up for this truth that might engender rabid reactions, like in the time of the, the, you know, the martyrs of the three centuries, it's surprising sometimes to read the stories where you think, why were people, why, why did the pagans get so angry when they, these Christians were simply saying, Christianus sum, right? I'm a Christian. That was enough for your head to get chopped off or for you to be viciously tortured. It seems disproportionate. But we see now that very simple truths, if you witness to them, might engender a lot of anger. And I think that the fearlessness with which we're supposed to be or that we are given as a gift that we see sometimes the joy of people like Navalny, joyfully, even though he's like skin and bones now, and he's like, I don't fear, and you don't fear. I think that there is a spe special kind of grace to that, uh, not because you want to put yourself in harm's way, but if, uh, I know that Inga is trying to throw me off the stage already with her stare, but um, <laughs> don't despair. I just, I'll finish this and I promise I will keep silent for a while. Um, if, if we were to overcome the fear that is prevalent in a lot of our culture, people suffering from anxiety and fear and a kind of lack of purpose and depression, I think that fearlessness and purpose of serving truth is even if you don't have to be in harm's way, even if you never have to stand up for something that's dangerous for either your career or your life, isn't it an antidote to a lot of the ills of our time and also of our church? Thank you, sister. And, and also for the reminder that the job of the moderator is a thankless one. <laughs> Uh, since part of it is to keep things moving. Oh, well, and, and with that, I will uh, break uh, one of the rules following Kole and, Kole and just add that uh, to George's example, I think that as Christians, um, we have to remember something that both Sister Vasa and Katie alluded uh, to, well, actually said in their talks. For us, truth is not relative. This is a brown piano. We have to believe 
the evidence of our experience, since our faith is the faith of experience. It's not an ideology. Our faith is the faith of the experience of the encounter and relationship with Christ. If we remember that, I think that martyrdom does not become easier. It just things become clearer. <laughs> Uh, what can those in parishes that do not outwardly condemn war do to bring attention to the wrongness of war? That's a very good That's process question. question, you know, yeah. down to our level of how we live our lives. I mean, just for the record, I have no good ideas about how anyone should live their lives. I literally have my dog's nanny on my phone right now. Um, but I do, th I think it goes back to this idea of bearing witness, right? And I think you can actually do more in your parishes than you can do, you know, on the internet or at a conference or anywhere else that's public because you know the people in your parishes. And my sense, what I like to believe on my better days is that people who believe, people who believe things that I think are unfortunate, anywhere ranging from unfortunate to evil are not themselves unfortunate or evil or on that spectrum. And you can witness to them in a way that people who don't know them cannot, because it's easy for them to dismiss, well, certainly me, but, um, or, you know, poor Sister Vasa, um, because she stood up on stage with us, um, but it's easy for people to dismiss people they don't know and condemn them as sort of people who want to destroy the church or who don't know what they're talking about or people who are just idiots, right? But they know you. And that should give you courage to speak to them because you really can witness to them in a way no one else can. Um, something we should probably learn from evangelicals, as much as I've kind of been on their case all day, is they're really good at teaching people how to witness one-on-one, -on -one, right? And they do it to kind of nefarious ends to like, you know, convert football players and things. But this idea that you build relationships with people and that when you've built that relationship, you can share truth with them is incredibly powerful. And I think that's I think that's the best I can offer in that situation is be in your par like your parish is meant to be your community and your family and be there and speak the truth and speak the truth over dinner and have unpleasant conversations about politics and religion where you're not supposed to have them. I'm rather curious. I have myself lived around the world and been in many religions and houses of worship and have many friends of different religions. Uh, so my question is, we all know, at least in this country, it's a big deal about the separation between church and state. And uh, this is for sister. Um, can you give an example uh, what seems to be Mr. Putin and uh, Kirill's symbiotic relationship? Can you give an example of somewhere previously in history where there was a relationship like that? Thank you for your question. If, if you. we don't mind, could we call him Patriarch Kirill? Yes. Just uh, because of his office. Um, I think that specifically the relationship as it stands now, uh, I don't think that it was exactly like this. I think that if you study the evolution of the relationship in the specifically in the Soviet period, I know these. it's not, unconnected to a certain older uh, story in Russian orthodoxy, uh, even before the revolution. Uh, it's even older than that. Uh, you might know that in uh, the Eastern Orthodox churches, uh, there is, uh, I think we're gonna hear more about symphony uh, and uh, the problematic aspect of the relationship between church and state uh, in the, it, I, can't, I can't make a blanket statement about the entire East, but if we stick to Russian Orthodoxy, I think that it's important to note that there's a common misconception that the way the problematic relationship stands now, it's not a situation of somebody being held hostage like the patriarch, 
uh, it's not a situation where he is acting against his will or in order to save the church. Uh, there's something that happened from the outset of the Soviet period. Again, I'm simply not talking about the previous period, not because it's not problematic, but when we have, uh, there's a sort of wrestling with the various, you know, there's Patriarch Tichon, but he's definitely like a hostage. Then I think it's 1925 when he, under suspicious circumstances and on annunciation, he dies in a hospital. Then there's various stories about the locum tenens. There's various ones, this Miesta Blustitzer, Patriarchova, whatever, Pristola. Finally, there is this agreement reached in 1927 with Metropolitan Sergius Strogorodsky. This agreement, but we're going to hear more about the story, I think, from Lena Zizulina, who is here. Um, there is a problematic document, the declaration that was, we think, signed under duress by this very well-educated bishop from pre-revolutionary Russia, Sergei Strogorodsky, the Metropolitan. And the document says there's a declaration of loyalty to the Soviet uh, regime a declaration that their sorrows and joys of the government, of this atheist government, right, that's militantly anti-Christian, the, their joys and sorrows are our joys and sorrows. This document was also sent out to bishops that were already outside of Russia, Russian bishops. It was demanded that they also sign it, be loyal to the Soviet government. Anyway, fast forward to a time when a lot of things happen after this period, especially World War II and, uh, well, before that, S Stalinism and vicious persecution of the church, almost nothing is left. Um, three bishops remained before the war that were at, at all, um, you know, that were not in concentration camps. Then, in order to help the war effort, when war erupts with um, Hitler Germany, Nazi Germany, uh, th things change because the church helps in the effort. The bishops that are then, you know, they f are brought out of the concentration camps. Churches are opened. Uh, once again, you know, people are allowed to go to church. The church is encouraged to support the war effort. And something changes. Uh, I'm skipping a lot of uh, the, the, you know, uh, phases of this, but it's important to note that eventually what we get in the Soviet Union is already people that are recruited to be bishops. I'm simplifying the picture, but they are recruited as already loyal uh, co-workers in the whole scheme of things of Soviet geopolitics and of Soviet like ideology. And they have publications. Well, the only publication would be the journal, the journal of the Moscow Patriarchate. They start working on a theology of peace that is part of a propaganda thing to, to present the Soviet Union also and the whole, you know, the Moscow, well, culture, they present to mostly the outside world a picture of a peace-seeking kind of um, both regime and a church that's working on a theology of peace, Bogoslovia Mira. And by the time we get to, you know, a later period after the, under Metropolitan Nikodim, things change. That's the very beginning of the 60s when the Moscow Patriarchate enters the World Council of Churches. And there's a whole new kind of, uh, we see a different type of bishop that is a recruited worker, also KGB agent, uh, who is working hand in hand with the Soviet government also to achieve certain geopolitical goals. And so we can't talk about someone who is under duress, not working actually equally in an engaged manner in certain for the geopolitical goals of a Soviet regime. And to see this as working for the church in any traditionally ecclesiological sense, uh, I find very difficult. It's, you might be working for your department, 
as in the Department of Religious Affairs, uh, and you can call that the Russian church, but it's very difficult to call that a traditional, you know, sort of protecting the church. And when we get to someone like Petra Kirill, uh, who is someone ordained by Metropolitan Yekadim, uh, we, we don't have a person that's somehow divorced from the kind of traditionalism and standing for a strong Russia and a church that is helping all of this. Um, so the problem is a lot deeper than, uh, you know, a church state kind of relations that we ever saw before, uh, even though the problem arises already earlier. And there is no the reason I talked about repentance uh, as far as my talk goes is that there was never work done. There was never work done really uh, in the Russian Orthodox tradition uh, to take a self-critical look and a very painful look at the past and to, in Christian terms, we would say repent. But we see it in secular uh, society that uh, secular voices demand taking a look at the past and uh, sometimes, you know, uh, making certain kinds of amends. Certainly Russia will have to do it in terms of reparations to Ukraine, but a historical kind of, you know, looking at the past and soul searching, I think it's a big problem that it wasn't done you know, even by the diaspora Russians, I am third generation Russian in the diaspora. My grandfathers fought in the white army and then in different directions from Russia emigrated. But I was brought up in third generation to, to I, I learned in the, I was born at the end of 1970. I know I don't look a day over 49, even though I'm 51, thank you. Um, I was taught that the Russian Revolution happened because of the Masons, the Freemasons. That's not popular to say anymore, but in my ghetto, the local ghetto, it was like, and the Jews, you know, Lenin was, was partly Jewish. It was like a masonsky zagavar, um, Judeo-Masonic uh, plot, you know, and then the Germans were somehow involved. So the West was involved because the Germans sent Lenin in a boxcar, you know, uh, into Russia. but. It wasn't, it certainly wasn't, you know, pious Orthodox Christians that had anything to do with this. Um, and that's a big problem, that there's no self-reflection. Uh, and everything was ideal in Tsarist Russia. That's my, that was my, uh, you know, version of Russian history that I grew up with. Now, I can understand with compassion now that I, I am very close to a war that's happening. I don't see it really firsthand, but it's so close. And I live in Vienna, Austria, for anybody who doesn't know. And the war is close enough, really. I can see why my grandparents and even their children were raised by tr people who were traumatized. I don't think this excuses us as a people that we to this day don't see that. But I'm realizing that these were people who raised their children and were themselves traumatized. And as a defensive reaction to having lost everything, right? Their world crumbled. And instead of looking forward, like some of, I think the best voices, like in American Orthodoxy, but they were first in Paris. I think those who had the courage to say, like Schmiermann, like Mayendorf, I'm very much a fan of this honesty to come to a country and say, look, uh, wake up and smell the coffee, right? Because we're here now. The sooner we realize that this is our new home and inhabit it, right? And have an American church, which is what today the Ukrainians are saying, you know, we're a sovereign nation and our, actually our canon law actually of the Orthodox church uh, is uh, actually has this principle that the there's 
we even learned this by heart in Greek for my canon law uh, education, uh, that uh, it's canon, uh, I really shouldn't say this when it's being filmed in case I get the reference wrong, but um, it, it, I think it's canon 38 of Trullo, if I'm mistaken, uh, that I'm mistaken, but uh, it, it says that uh, the political and parochial tis politikis ke dimosis tipis, types, um, ke, uh, should also uh, 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 follow, uh, should be followed by, excuse me, should be followed by the ecclesiastical uh, borders. So ecclesiastical borders have to follow the types of uh, borders that are already formed by the, uh, the political ones. Why? Because the church is not supposed to be creating her own sort of governments or gov governances. And if there are wars between governments, you put in a very uncomfortable position those who might, as it is today in Ukraine, it makes it impossible for if they're under, say, a patriarch of a country that is hostile to their local country. So there is a canonical uh, principle that says that we should be inhabiting the political territory, leaving that to the state, right, to form borders. Um, and so I think that the vision of uh, adhering to the territorial principle uh, makes things simpler. And we shouldn't pretend uh, if if we want to claim constantly to be so traditional, um, you know, there are things that I don't think that we necessarily have to reinvent. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think I wandered from the question, but it was interesting anyway, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sister. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, and so, uh, Thank you very much to all the presenters and, of course, everybody who uh, participated in the discussion. Uh, and uh, on this, I would like to conclude tonight's um, segment of the conference. Uh, thank you to everyone who followed us on Zoom. Uh, we are going to resume tomorrow um, the Zoom uh, uh, broadcasts will uh, begin at nine o'clock Eastern daytime. Uh, so that's nine o'clock New York. Uh, and we do hope to see um, as many or more of you there than uh, we see right now. And then for uh, everyone who's uh, here in Seacliff, um, we'd like to invite you to continue this conversation uh, over dinner and drinks. Thank you very much.